Good morning. Today, we're going to try to take a look at whether Collins actually has created a fable, has created a myth, has created some folklore out of the fact that children don't like the idea they don't run the world and the idea that teenagers in particular uh, believe that they are living in a dystopian world uh, no matter where they're living or how they're living and the idea that a novel with its centerpiece being an arena where children randomly picked from various districts around a country that was once the United States fight to the death for the entertainment of those in the capital and to punish the districts that rebelled against the capital. Did she create a fable or a myth? And we're going to also, as you can see, talk about audience. I think first we're going to talk about defining myth. A guy named Walter Burkert said that myth is a traditional tale with secondary partial reference to something of collective importance. Traditional tale generally means that something was told orally for generations before it was written down, that it could have different variation in the northeast part of the region versus the southwest part of the region, that a lot of the details might be the same, but not all of them. And we noticed that, I think, in the traditional tale in the uh, memoir, A Long Way Gone, the idea that uh, the bra spider story could have different versions uh, depending on who was telling it. The idea of secondary partial reference to something of collective importance. First of all, myths are stories. Straight up, let's take a look at the secondary partial reference to something of collective importance. My definition of myth, they're stories that seek to explain rituals, the natural events or features, you know, why did the Grand Canyon get there? Um, there was the American folklore, the idea that Paul Bunyan created it. Historical events, uh, we build myths around all sorts of things. Why a famous historical personage is famous? For example, you know, George Washington is famous not just because of the fact that he was the first president, not just because he was the general who uh, led the troops to the, you know, to the important victories that uh, won America's independence. He's also famous because of the story about the cherry tree. Uh, Abraham Lincoln is famous not for being the president who ushered us through the Civil War or being the president who uh, signed the Emancipation Proclamation or gave the great speech at Gettysburg. He's famous for all of those, but he's also famous for the stories about uh, somebody who uh, gave him too much change and he walked miles to return it. And sometimes they're going to explain cosmological patterns. Um, they're going to explain why the stars move in the way they do. They're going to explain why, um, you know, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, why we have seasons. Myths are going to seek to explain. I don't think that we're going to get explanations of cosmological patterns or famous people from fiction um, or any of the ritual sorts of things from this, from this novel. However, I think that fables, unlike myths, can do some warning and give us some ideas about how the world ought to be. So perhaps she's not necessarily doing a myth, but doing a fable. We're gonna keep going and see what, ha what we can discern. I think the last thing I wanna mention about myths is the idea that we should view them as symbolically and metaphorically true, even if they're factually false. And at this point, perhaps when we go back to yesterday's discussion of theme, or Wednesday's discussion of theme, excuse me, we can see where perhaps the Hunger Games can fit this idea of myth, this idea of fable, where it is symbolically and metaphorically true, even though it's fiction and it's obviously fiction. Myths create dichotomies frequently, especially creation myths, but other myths do too. So there's this idea of discerning light from dark, differentiating young from old, uh, creation stories differentiated water from dry land, um, 
discerning order from chaos, male from female, all of those become the function of myth or happen in myth. And if you look at page four, we have this dichotomy. We're talking about younger, we're distinguishing worn, but not so beaten down. Um, you know, Prim's face, I gotta work on my typing skills. Prim's face is as fresh as a raindrop, as lovely as the primrose for which he was named. So now I have fresh versus worn. I have lovely versus beaten down. I have a dichotomy set up here uh, on page four. And we also have a dichotomy of what ought to be, Kalas ought to type properly versus what actually happens, Kalas type poorly. I think where Collins perhaps is getting closer to myth is in the idea of how an audience can react to it. The ancient Greek myths, as the title on the slide says, have lifelong appeal, okay? Early childhood, they're food for the spirit. They're great adventure stories. Heracles kills the Hydra. Theseus kills the Minotaur. Uh, Perseus kills Medusa. Uh, Bellerophon kills the Chimera. Bellerophon rides Pegasus. Uh, Achilles fights bravely at Troy. All of those sorts of things were great adventure stories. The, you know, the version of the Fast and the Furious for kids uh, in ancient Greece. As they grow older, the stories develop, the stories evolve. And I think it's important to understand that art and everything about it sprang from uh, the myths. I don't think, again, that Collins necessarily does that. But if we take a look at comic books, um, kids read comic books at age 6, 8, 10, 12, and lots of adults are going to watch all the Marvel and DC movies. Uh, and the Marvel and DC movies should, uh, if they're going to appeal to adults, have a deeper meaning than just the stuff in the comics. And again, just to move it a step further, the idea that when they became the tragedies, the audience that filled the benches at these performances regarded events and sufferings they beheld as the most profound expression of the meaning of all human life. It's a big thing for a guy who just chopped off uh, a hydra's head and two grow back. The most profound expression of the meaning of all human life, coming from the theater, coming from the myths, coming from the stories. So again, can a story centered around an arena where children fight to the death. Be that. Can it give us the most profound expression of the meaning of all human life? I don't know. But I do think that readers will view the Hunger Games trilogy differently. Uh, this is from Christina uh, Bruns, and she is talking about this idea of Reading the story is a middle-aged parent who does not identify with Katniss, but cares for her. She's able to engage deeply with the second in the part of the novel, or second part of the trilogy, excuse me, Mockingjay. However, students who were close to Katniss's age lost Katniss, the person whom they identified. They lost their way into where they could get, inhabit the imagined world. And they lost it because it was not a simple hero's journey, but a story of war and its effects. And they weren't willing to go on that journey because they wanted to become Katniss. Just like for the ancient Greeks, they wanted that adventure story when they were young, but they couldn't adapt right away to the profound meaning of human life. However, the older woman is at least able to say, I could ident I didn't need to identify with Katniss. I'm a mom. I care about children. I care about Katniss. Age affects how one reads the Hunger, Hunger Games. Age probably affects how one interprets the Hunger Games. And I think if one reads this 
at different times in one's life, one can get deeper into certain aspects of it and ignore some of the big adventure aspects of it as one grows older. And perhaps it is taking on the form of a fable, at least in the level that different readers can approach it differently. And finally, her conclusion, the appeal to the Hunger Games story for young readers depends on Katniss's strength. Fiction can provide readers the experience of, of a self powerful enough to reign stable in the face of overwhelming adversity. That seems to me to be a truth that is important for teenagers as well as adults. And I think, again, though teenagers might want the hero's journey, adults might want different elements. And you can take a look at whether or not The Hunger Games provides those elements. There's a caveat, and there's always a caveat. We talked about Aaron in The Knife of Never Letting Go, and we talked about how Eden in The Knife of Never Letting Go, and we talked about how Patrick Ness took those stories and turned them upside down. Just because a novel borrows a story or retells a myth doesn't make the novel a myth. I think perhaps uh, Miller was right when we talked about her in the last slide. Perhaps this novel goes a bit beyond normal young adult fiction, and perhaps it has elements of fable in it. Certainly readers are able to react to it in different ways at different ages, just like uh, people exposed to the original myths reacted to things differently. But I do want to give this caveat. There's myths in here. It doesn't make the novel a myth. The Hunger Games adapts the Theseus story pretty liberally. You know, King Minos of Crete defeated King Aegeus of Athens in a war. The capital defeated the other districts in a war. Minos demands that Athens send seven young men and seven young women to Crete as tribute. Whether that happened yearly or every seven years or every nine years depended on who translated the story. But it was, you know, there was this tribute. The capital demands that each district send a young man and a young woman as tribute every year. It works. The tributes are placed in a labyrinth to face the Minotaur and be killed. The tributes are forced to complete in the games. All but one dies. We're getting pretty close to, this is a carbon copy of the Theseus story. Theseus volunteers a tribute after accomplishing many heroic deeds on his journey to Athens. Katniss volunteers as tribute to save her sister after feeding her family for years. Once again, the volunteering element is close. Theseus defeats the Minodar, escapes the labyrinth with help from Ariadne, Minos's daughter. She fell in lust with him. She taught him the, she taught, went to Daedalus, the guy who built the um, labyrinth. Daedalus told her to take a ball of yarn, tie it to the front gate, unravel it, and then when you get to the middle, fight the Minotaur, and then roll it up as you walk out. Katniss defeated the games with help from Hamish, Peta, Cinna, and Rue from District 11. There was a romance between Theseus and Ariadne. That romance ended badly when he ditched her on the island of Naxus. She curses him, and the romance between Pete and Katniss is ending badly at the end of this novel. It foreshadows future misfortune. This is a pretty clear adaptation of the Theseus myth. However, that adaptation does not make it a myth, and I think that's important to understand. If we're going to view it as a myth, does it have an explanatory function? Does that explanatory function grow? as the readers age and develop intellectually, those are the questions I think that one needs to ask as one looks at this as, as myth. Okay, this is gonna wrap it up for today. I hope everybody has a good weekend coming up and we'll keep going uh, next week with the Hunger Games.